I'm starting off with photos and then we'll get into the video, which this time is for hardcore restores. Or it could be for people very curious as to what makes the best restorations the best, which this 1970 Boss Mustang is. First, it's restored by this guy, Bob Perkins, who became the head MCA judge in 1985 and has restored Mustangs full time, mainly Boss Mustangs since 1981. What makes Bob Perkins' shop special is his inventory of NOS parts, parts he gathered from stopping at over 3,000 Ford dealerships over the past 35 or so years as he was on his way to to and from Mustang shows. This Grabber Orange Boss 429 has 1,608 original miles, but it's restored. Restored where it needs to be restored and to perfection with the skills and the NOS parts Bob Perkins has gathered over a lifetime. This Mustang is one of four Boss 429s to achieve MCA's Authenticity Award in the thoroughbred class even the battery has to be original, and I mean 1970 vintage. So, two of Bob's sons, Andrew and James, pushed this Boss 429 into the restoration shop. Bob raised the car on a lift so he could point out how to restore the undercarriage. In the process, he reveals details of a restoration to the highest degree anybody has ever seen. I mean, some of the details are almost laughable, such as stretch marks in the metal. I'm not kidding. Wait till you see this. This is hardcore for sure. So let me know what you think in the comments. Here again, it's going to take some detective work. And if you start with a really nice, clean, say, Southern California car, you're going to be able to find all these paint over spray patterns, sound deadener patterns, colors of the primers, and how much overspray was on the floor pan, how, how heavy the drips and runs were in the floor pan. And uh, you got to look at your own car because no two cars are alike and things changed from assembly plant, um, the different shift within the same assembly plant, and as the year went on things were changed and upgraded or downgraded however you want to look at it. So you really need to look and, and have definitive detailed shots of your own car and uh, if for instance the car's already been restored and totally stripped um, then you can't do that then you've got to look at cars that were built in the same time period at the same assembly plan as your car maybe find your build sheet and then do your documentation that way but you know like I've always said um, the best cars when they're done were the better cars to start with and uh, that is really important but here what we're kind of giving you is a general guide of how things were done. Certain things were always bare metal, certain things were always painted. We're going to try to describe some of that, show some of the assembly line procedures so that it'll help you in detailing your own car. The vast assortment of parts, primer, and paint on a first generation Mustang creates a mosaic that is nothing short of automotive art. 65 to 73, uh, most of the undercarriage characteristics are, are very similar. There's some minor differences between assembly plants on colors of things of the undercarriage primers and things, but as far as what stayed natural bare metal and what was painted, what gets blacked out is pretty much universal throughout the Mustang first generation 65 to 73. You know, a lot of people don't put as much emphasis on the underside of the car as they do on the, under the hood and the exterior paint body work and things like that, but I think uh, to do a complete restoration, the undercarriage detail is probably more intricate than any other aspect of the car. It started out as a unibody and the cars were not dipped, so after the cars were welded together and they started to go down the paint line, the undercarriage was painted. Okay, from the firewall forward here, there was a variation also and what colors could be on, on this. Now when they painted the engine bay um, after the car was painted the black paint would, would, would blow down in here to a certain degree but there was no tape lines. It was just like a overspray from when they painted the, the engine bay. Now on the bottom of the frame rails here typically 
there was very little primer, if any, on the bottom of those frame rails. And it was just overspray when they did the side of the inter engine compartment walls or the outside of the inner fender walls, things like that. So this up in here, up inside here where the uh, strut rods go, um, the front frame rail here, usually not a lot of, lot of paint on there. It was mainly oversprays from different aspects of painting the car. And that varied. A lot of times you'll see rusty, bare metal, and you'll see spot welds showing through and things like that. It just depended, but there wasn't a lot of emphasis, it seems, on, on getting the paint coverage up in here. The undercarriage, basically the belly pan here, from about here to the rear of the car, was, was done by automation. There was spray jets, and this was for the body color primer. And this being a Dearborn car, it has what we often refer to as a slop gray color. It's a dark gray with a little green blue. It, it varied all over the place from different Dearborn cars on different days. And it was a lot of it was batch paint or leftover paint mixed in with the primer. From 1965 to 73, the lower control arms were dipped in paint, like three-fourths of the weight. They wanted to leave the uh, ball joint rubbers and the ends exposed so that they didn't have paint on them. And then uh, tie rods were always bare metal. Now sometimes they were, they were uh, when they were heat treated, they were dipped in oil and then they turned darker black like on the 70s. If they were heat treated but, but cooled in water, then they stayed more of a shiny bright metal. Okay, until 1970, um, the lower, or all the tie rod ends, were, were quenched in water so they didn't turn real black like these 70s. 70 to 73 were darker on the on the tie rods. Your strut rods right here, those were always bare metal, 65 to 73. Just uh, heat treated bare metal, cooled with water so they didn't turn dark. Okay, Front sway bars, typically front sway bars were black. Some, some assembly plants I believe that the, the uh, front sway bars were, were heat treated and quenched in oil and they turned real dark but they weren't black. On the bosses they were always black. All the Dearborn cars were always black on those. Now if we move up down, down here a little bit, um, we see the transmission. The transmissions were bare. This is a four speed top loader. The bell housing was bare, cast iron. Okay, the exhaust system, always bare. Uh, cold rolled steel, no plating, no finish. This is typical 69-70 uh, um, type Boss 429 um, new old stock original exhaust. The transmission cross member here as you can see is bare metal. Okay, it's just bare metal and you can see the weld marks, the heat, tree, heat marks from where the bracket was welded onto the cross member. The uh, transmission insulator for the 70 Boss 429 had a green paint identification mark on it. Moving back down through here now, the inlet pipes on the exhaust system, these are bare steel. Okay, the clamps are bare steel. The clamps were stamped from Moco. And as you can see on, on original clamps, the um, Fomoco was stamped in the steel before they stamped out the or made the clamp. So the Fomoco is distorted. The reproductions, the Fomoco stamp is nice and crisp because it was stamped in there after the clamp was made. And then moving down to the muffler assembly here, see now the mufflers on the bosses were aluminized. And you can see that this is a, a plated metal and they have a little bit different finish of course than this, and then rather, rather than the cold stamp rolled steel. Um, so the uh, mufflers are aluminized. Drive shafts, again, bare steel. Okay, parking brake cables, bare metal. Moving into the uh, rear end housing here now. Um, several different finishes on the housing. The uh, axle tube itself is semi-gloss black. The third member chunk is, a, is some type of a red oxide primer. It was primed before it was machined, so you'll see that the, uh, the third member here, there's some machined surfaces here and that was done after this was already dipped in their, in their red primer. As, if you look close you can see 
the opening in the center section for the center section here is machined. Okay, the gasket is a is a dark gray, almost black gasket. The old B7A part number gaskets conform to the um, openings here. The later ones that you get that they used in the Ford trucks, they cover up all the machine surfaces and they hang out with funny edges on them. They just don't look right. But these are getting really tough to find. But as we mentioned before, the third member was dipped in the red paint. Then it was machined. Same thing with the Daytona pinion support. You can see all the machine surfaces. Okay, um, the yoke, the slinger here, the uh, pinion snubber guard here, that stuff is all bare metal. And there again, uh, this is pretty typical for, for 65 to 73 Mustang. Okay, the rear shocks, boss shocks were always black, semi-gloss black. And on the uh, boss nine, they had a paint identification code of one orange and one red daub. The uh, rear leaf springs, bare metal. You can see they were heat treated, so they've got a darker look to them. The clamps are just uh, cold rolled, rolled stamped steel, so they're pretty shiny. And then you have the uh, black insulators in between the springs. Um, getting to the tailpipes now on the exhaust system, the tailpipes on the 70 Boss were also aluminized. And uh, you can see the, the clamps are bare steel, the hangers are bare steel. I left the uh, service part tag on the exhaust because it's a new old stock system and it's super rare to find a system. The tag wouldn't have been on the car when it was brand new, but I just kind of like it because it was a new piece that I've had for about 30 years before I put it on the car. It's really a hard piece to find. <clears throat> Gas tanks are bare steel. Um, actually, they're plated. It's a it's a, a tin plating on them. The sending unit is tin plated. The lead tin coating on there. The um, hose clamps on here. You can see these are the the knuckle scratchers with the square tabs on them. The new ones that the that they sell today are rounded edges so that they won't cut your fingers or your knuckles so easily. And uh, going back to the rear valance here now. The rear valance was painted on the car with just a couple screws hanging. So you'll see some body spray overspray in here, and then there's some of the factory sound deadener. That was put on before the valance was put on the car. But if you look up inside here, you'll see bare metal and primer showing up in there where the overspray from painting the, the unibody didn't get into those areas. Okay, details here on the back of the uh, rear end assembly. Um, these were marks that were on this one that we took pictures of and photographed. Some of the markings we can identify. The 982 is the Ford internal number for a 391 traction lock. Uh, we mentioned before that the dobs on the uh, shocks here and there's stripes on the drive shaft. If you're lucky enough to still have a build sheet, that stuff will usually show up on the build sheet. Now on, on some more details here, the U-bolts are bare steel. The shackles uh, or the uh, shock plates are, are bare steel. The sway bar plate is bare steel. And the rear sway bar, again, is, is semi-gloss black. Finishing up on the details here on the right-hand side, the uh, brake backing plates are semi-gloss black. The rear drums are bare metal. They're cast iron, and the edges are machined. OK. On, on uh, this tip, this assembly here, this is a Bendex, so it has the rubber plug in here in the adjuster hole with the 8A2092. Now, if this would have been a Kelsey Hayes backing plate, it wouldn't have the numbers. It would be smooth here. I, I believe the other side is a Kelsey Hayes. The two uh, identification stripes for two medium blue stripes. The 3029 is the 302nd day of 69, that's a date code. If you look up here, this is the engineering number stamped in the rear leaf spring. All important details, you know, on original cars and uh, anything in a concourse class. The identification mark on the small hole Magnum 500 15 by 7 wheels is a white daub, and it's actually two white daubs, one on the bottom, one on the top of the inside band. Okay, now we're going to move to the left side. 
and as you can see over here the identification code on the left side is one white one blue stripe and the adjuster hole plug as you can see here is smooth it's got real small little little uh, cross hatches in it but there's no identification number in it this is typical of a Kelsey Hayes backing plate and it's, it's um, you know they came as assemblies the left and the right so it's not uncommon to have a Kelsey Hayes on one side and a Bendix on the other side and the date on this one here again is 302nd day of 69 the wheel with the white daub on it um, same engineering number on the rear spring and this is also the original uh, paper identification tag identifying the third member which is a, a 982 and uh, that denotes a uh, 391 traction lock and uh, rarely do you see one of these in good enough shape where you can use it over again but this happens to be the original one off the car here's a kind of a unique little item that you don't see too often left still on the parking brake cable but this is um, an assembly line uh, from the axle plant typically they were either pulled off at the assembly line or just from years of wear and tear and changing parking brake cables or working on the cars somebody ripped them off the car pretty cool detail item okay now we're going to look at the uh, details here a little closer on the floor pan and uh, if you look really close you can see little stretch marks and wrinkles in the in the sheet metal here where the overspray doesn't quite um, look as heavy as it does in areas and, and this is all factory stamping stretch marks in the metal this you usually don't find on a car that that's been up in the north where you know it's been uh, subject to harsh weather and road salt and uh, if you have to have pitted metal and you sand the pits out of the metal you lose those little stamping stretch marks in the bare metal and uh, that's what's really cool about this car the floor pan was just so spectacular having only 1600 miles on it it should be perfect like that but that is really a cool detail that you just can't save on most cars because they do have pitting and restorers either fill the pits and paint over it so you lose the stretch marks or they use a little sound editor to cover it up the pits and uh, that's really a cool detail these drippies in the primer here, um, probably about 85% of this stuff is all the original paint and we just cleaned it and, and, and painted over the top of it to save it. If you look really close, when they bake the paint, the, the drips dried up and they'll pop sometimes. And uh, that's really a cool detail. Kind of hard to duplicate. Um, but this floor pan on this car was just phenomenal to start with. Okay, here's another little detail. The uh, floor plugs. Um, were galvanized metal. The screws are just black uh, zinc screws. The uh, strip caulk that's between the floor plug and the, the body floor um, opening here is the dark gray strip caulk. And uh, it's not black, it's dark gray. And this is some of the old stuff that we've used over the years, the old Autolite stuff. And uh, that's kind of a nice detail too. 65 to 73 Mustangs primarily were, were run down the line on two frame skids and we have two of those original frame, frame skids behind the shop we can take a picture of but where they sat on this dolly it left a ring of bare metal and there will be one here up in the front there will be one here underneath the floor underneath the seat see the bare metal there will be one here on the frame rail you have to come around the back side here with the light to see that one. Okay, and then in the back back here, you'll see a double circle. Okay, and the reason there's a double circle, this circle here on Dearborn built cars, Dearborn cars, the Mustang and the Cougar were built on the same line. When I show you the frame jig out there, you'll see that there's there's two pads for it to sit on and the Cougar was two inches longer so that's why there's a bare metal mark there. These are two assembly line skids that the unibody sat on at, from Dearborn Assembly. At the front here is two guide pins. The, the frame just sat on there. There was nothing to bolt it down. This is just a guide pin for the front 
uh, frame rail. Okay. And then when we go back here, this would be right under the seat pan. Um, there's two more um, bosses here. These actually took a bolt, so they went through the floor and bolted them in so that the, the body couldn't fall off the skid. Okay, the third attachment point, or a third boss, there again, just sat there. It was just a, a, a brace for it to sit on. Okay, no guide pin, no bolt. And then the rear here, there's a double, double um, boss here where, you, where it took a bolt, and the front one was for the Mustang. The rear one was for the 67 to 70 Cougar.